Okay, welcome to class. Uh, first lecture, first part. Uh, this is uh, CS4510. I think it's called Automata and Complexity. I will explain what those words mean. Uh, but let's just quickly uh, sort of go over the syllabus. Right, so uh, who am I? My name is Brahim or Abraham or Abrahim. Uh, I think my parents disagree on how to pronounce that, so you can just call me anything. Uh, we have a TA, his name is Saman Sakar. Excuse me, Somnanth. Uh, we do have a piazza. We're both going to be on piazza answering questions. I think in an asynchronous course like this, half of the effort is spent looking at piazza, I think. Looking at, you know, uh, just sort of general discussion. It's uh, really important. Uh, so summer courses, there's less weeks. I think a normal semester is something like 13 weeks. We have like 10. Um, and... But each lecture in a normal thing is like an hour and 15 minutes. We have uh, nearly two hours of time, 10 minutes uh, for a break. So my plan is to sort of basically cover as much as or less material, where each lecture is actually split up into two parts, like a quote unquote pre-break and then a, a post-break. But since it's all asynchronous and all pre-recorded, it doesn't matter. So it's just going to be our four hours a week of videos. Um, so let's talk about that's how the class is going to be structured. And that includes today. So let's talk about uh, what the grading is going to look like. So we're going to have uh, five exams. Each is 12.5% uh, with one dropped, right? So it might seem like a lot of exams, especially for summer, but I prefer to have a lot of exams with each worth less points. So if you bomb something, it's not like you're not going to die, right? Like, so if I bombed a, 30, a midterm, which was 30% of my grade, I might consider like dropping the course. But here it's like, you know, and they're not like as hard as what, a normal exam might be because there's more of them. I would think of them like slightly more than quizzes, but less than exams, right? So each of these, you're going to have a 24 hour period to do. They're going to be uh, open book and open notes. So uh, yeah, you just can't work together. Um, for the homeworks, we're going to have between six and 10 homeworks. And those are going to evenly divide up the remaining 50%. Uh, those are going to have, there's also going to be one dropped, the lowest one. No, I think if it wasn't the lowest one, that wouldn't be really interesting. Uh, and you're, you're going to have seven days to do each one. Right? So they're sort of supposed to align up with the weeks where we don't have an exam or something like that. Um, also, if you latex your assignment, I will give you five bonus points per exam, uh, per homework, excuse me. Also, if you find an uh, answer to a homework question online, a citation enough is enough of full credit. Uh, you know, I don't want people just copying things, but, and I don't think the questions are that Googleable, so that's my thing. You're allowed to collaborate with each other, but please turn in individual uh, solutions. Right. Uh, so the book we're going to be using is a really great book. It's by Sipser, Michael Sipser. And it's called Introduction uh, to the Theory of Computation, or something like that. This is a great book. When I took this course, I didn't care for the book. Uh, I've taken a lot of courses, and in every subject, there is a best book, usually. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the best book is a good book. This is a subject where the 
best book is like a really, really good book. Especially in an asynchronous course, I would recommend you just grab the book and you just start reading it. You just read it until it stops because the book is really easy. It sort of like reads itself to you. It's very nice uh, in that regard. Read it until you get stuck. It almost it holds your hand. Excuse me. It holds your hand like through a lot of stuff. Uh, right. So that's mostly sort of the boring stuff of the uh, syllabus. So let's talk about what to what this course uh, this, this course actually is. So I like to think of this course as answering really two questions. What are the fundamental limits of computers? And the second question, what makes uh, some problems easy and others hard. So the first question, the answer is the study of computability theory. We have mostly solved this first question. Um, research was done on this like from Alan Turing's paper around 1936 until, I don't know, the 70s, uh, maybe 60s, when people realize this is sort of solved and we, we don't have to, we can start asking other questions. Then most of the work switched to this question, which is called uh, complexity theory. Uh, this subject has a lot of open questions, which we really can't answer. Uh, some famous ones everyone knows is like, does P equal NP or not, right? And we'll talk about what that means. By the end of this course, you should know in very good depth what that means. That's a question that's often misdescribed in like popular science, but, you know, it's a very important question. So that's a, a big study of the complexity theory. So not only is this a hard question for us to answer, but we have results which say why this question is hard. In that regard, the study of this course is very... In some sense, it's very philosophical and meta. Like, these are some really abstract kind of, uh, you know, like, if someone wants to waste your time, they would ask questions like this, right? Uh, but we're going to be able to answer some of this stuff. So, and just to define what an automata is, an automata is just a toy computer. It's a theoretical construction that we use to talk about relative power. And that's going to be mostly in the complexity theory section. So, okay. So uh, now I'm going to talk about, you know, how we talk about these questions. These are abstract questions, but we need a way to discuss them. And what we're going to do is borrow tools from formal language theory, which I'll get into right now. So just to start with 1 million definitions. Right? So let's say, uh, uh, definition, what is a problem? So a decision problem is what? It's, uh, you have some input, some set of inputs, some infinite set of inputs, and then uh, decision problem is just a yes or no categorization. Or it's, you know, you can say true or false, or one or zero. So uh, consider the decision problem then, right, on the integers. Uh, if x is an integer, it's a positive integer, and uh, x is prime, that is a decision problem. So to talk more about this, though, we need, we need some more. So... An alphabet uh, is a set of symbols. 
finite set of symbols. And we denote it as uh, sigma. So this can be uh, 0, 1. And this is, in fact, the canonical representation. If I don't specify the alphabet ever, just assume it's the binary alphabet, 0, 1. I didn't define what a symbol was, but maybe you can know that it's just anything you write on a piece of paper as a single glyph. It is a glyph, it is a letter, it's a symbol, it's unambiguous. Other examples of alphabets, I could say, you know, A, B, C. I could say the English alphabet, so I could say A, comma, dot, 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 to Z, uh, comma, capital A, comma, dot, 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 to Z, right? And then maybe some punctuation or something, and I'd say, okay, that's a typewriter, or that's the English alphabet or whatever. Yeah, um, so that's it, that's it to an alphabet. So then a string is a sequence of symbols from the alphabet. So like examples of strings are 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, A, B, A, B, and so on. It's just sort of, you know, what, what you understand naturally to be a string is as someone who knows what a computer does. Okay? There's a special string called epsilon. It's called the uh, empty string. We denote this as epsilon. In uh, latex, it's called var epsilon. Right, and basically, it's the only string uh, of uh, length uh, zero. All right, so obviously these strings have length. This is length two. This is length three. This is length four. Epsilon is the only string of length zero. And if you think, well, wait a minute, how can you do that? You might, you know, again appeal to programming languages, where in every language you can do something like string. Any serious language, I'll say, uh, string a equals empty. Right, so that's probably valid Java. Python, it's just you just get rid of that. There you go. You can do that. That's totally possible. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to give this as a definition, but I'm going to I'm going to call it sigma i. So when I say uh, sigma i, I mean uh, strings of length i right so if i write if if uh if sigma equals 0 comma 1 and i write sigma 2 sigma squared i mean the set of four elements that looks like this 0 0 0 1 1 0 1 1 and uh, if I say sigma zero, I mean just the set of the empty string, right? Um, also, as an aside, if I say something like uh, zero to the i, I mean zero, 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 that's i times, right? So as another side, so zero, zero, two, one, three, as a string means zero zero one one one, right? This is just a shorthand we use for like makes things plenty simpler, right? It wasn't maybe worth its own definition, but it's uh, there. You go. Now, uh, there I'm going to define an operator called the clean star or clayney star. Fun fact, the guy who invented this uh, would pronounce his name Claney, but his son was like, yeah, he made that up. Everyone I've ever known historically before my dad called it clean. I call it clean. History is always called it clean, but my dad liked to call it Claney. So I don't know if we call it Claney to respect the author who this is named after, or if we call it clean to respect everyone else who has ever been named clean. I don't know, but if that's how it's called. And what, what this is, is simply we say Sigma star. 
Okay, it's just the star operator. If you're familiar with regex from Linux or from, I don't know where else regex might be used, this might seem familiar. It basically means zero or more of something, right? So if you can imagine taking that um, understanding, this is the union over i equals zero uh, to infinity of sigma i, which is equal to the set something like epsilon, zero, one, zero, 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 one, and so on. It's an infinite set, so it goes on forever. But it's very common notation. We're going to keep referring to it as a sigma uh, star. I might also sometimes, or I might not, but you might see this as 0, comma 1 star. So this is a set to the clean star operation, which is just, again, done the same way. Uh, so now the clean star, uh, might you might be interested to know that this is like the set of all strings, right? So every string is in sigma star, every single one. And finally, the last uh, definition is a language, which is the probably the most important. A uh, language is any uh, uh, subset of sigma star. So we're going to be talking a lot about languages, kinds of languages. Our entire thing is understanding these subsets of all sets. So just kinds of sets of strings and their complements. Uh, yes. So what we have is a sort of way to go from decision problems to language problems, right? So if, if uh, for example, let Here's some sub. Here's some example languages. Let L equal uh, x is a string. I'll say L one equals x is a string such that uh, x starts with zero. Okay. I could also do something like x uh, is a string. And x uh, has an even number of ones, right? I can do things like, uh, uh, you know, here's something more complicated. x is a string such that if we let n be the integer representation of x, it's a binary number then n is prime. Right, so what n is, is I'm taking the integer and I'm turning it into, I'm taking the string and casting it as a number. So things like 0, 1, and 1 would also, would, would end up equaling 1, right? Uh, what we have done here is we've gone from a sort of functional idea of understanding problems to a set theoretic one. And this is really powerful because it lets us use like the calculus of set theory. We can take unions and complements of things and and really functions are just like sets if you think about it. Like if you consider f of x squared, this is really a function, but it's really a set. So let's say f, define f, capital F to be the subset of the Cartesian plane such that f is... Uh, the set of pairs x comma y again in the Cartesian plane, such that um, y times y no x times x equals y, right? We can do something similar uh, with these sets, which is why it's great. As another aside. The choice of alphabet uh, does not matter, right? As long as it's not unary. There's some funny things that happen when you are unary. A unary alphabet has one element in it. So it's literally like, you know, you're telling sticks. You don't even get to do that. That's not correct unary. This is unary for five. You have a pile of sticks. Okay, you're a caveman. You haven't invented uh, binary fingers yet or whatever. Um, the choice of alphabet does not matter. The properties you want to study are going to be independent of 
the way we represent them mostly so consider like 17 so like what is 17 17 doesn't exist it's made up it's like a thing it's an abstraction we use to talk about something you cannot have a 17 you can have 17 of something like you can have 17 bananas and you say okay i have 17 bananas and i take away five bananas i have 12 bananas but uh, that's the same as if I had 17 and I take away 5, it's going to be the same number of bananas. So we have this abstraction. I We represent this concept of 17 with these symbols, this 1 and this 7, right, as a string. So, for example, some property of 17 is like 17 is prime. 17 and 10, and I'll say write that like that way, so same base 10, is prime. But so is this in binary, which is 16, 8, 4, 2, 1. 16 plus 1, and that's in base 2. But this is also prime. But both of these are just representations for our monkey brain as part of how we perceive this concept of 17. So the things we want to study about languages, about computation, are going to be independent of the alphabet choice. So for most, most problems, unless it's something weird and exotic, you can assume it's just the binary alphabet. Makes everything nice, makes everything easy. Okay, um, let's talk more now about a first uh, toy model of a computer. So first, let's talk about you know what is a computer, right? So let's let's define a machine. Uh, this is just my definition. I say a machine uh, takes on some strings. And we'll output uh, a, a yes or no. So we say, uh, and the definition here is decides. So we say M decides L if M, when you run it on string X, M accepts if and only if x was in our language and m and m run on x rejects if and only if x was not in the language so by accept or reject here you could imagine this is a physical steam powered box which is making lots of noise and it has two bulbs on it that go off when it's done or something you know who cares there's some there's, you can have some sort of creative visual, visualization of this uh, but it only accepts things that are in the language and if they're not in the language then it rejects them so this is sort of a decider this is sort of a gatekeeper to this language you can give it any string and it'll say in uh, in L or not in L so our first toy computer our first automata is called a DFA and that stands for uh, deterministic finite automata. Now, what that means will make sense uh, soon. But a DFA is a tuple. I'm not going to call it deterministic finite automata. I'm just going to refer it throughout the course from here on out as a DFA. It's a tuple. Uh, it's a five thing. So there's sigma which is just the alphabet, as we know and love. Uh, there is a set of states, Q. So this is normally denoted as something like Q0 to who knows, Qn, Qk. You know, we enumerate them like that, some finite set of states. Then we have a special state we call the start state, which is denoted by Q0 usually. It's the start state. Uh, we have a transition function, and this is the only interesting part of this whole thing. The transition function is denoted by delta. It takes a state, and it takes a symbol of the alphabet, and it uh, produces another state. And then we have a set of what we call final states, or accepting states.
So f here is simply just a subset of uh, q. So f is you know a proper subset or the whole set of q. Uh, then uh, a computation. Uh, so it's a, a a computation of a DFA D on a string X is uh, just N applications of Delta and uh, except if uh, last state is in a f is in f, it's a final state. This is kind of really complicated and kind of you know f formal, and the for the formality here, the rigor doesn't really give us anything yet. So let's just draw pictures because pictures are a lot better to understand this. These are a lot. This is a lot easier than this definition uh, would have you believe. So. Let's give a DFA for the language L1, which is L1, if you recall, is uh, X is a string, and X starts with uh, 0. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a start state here. Let me see if I can use my circle tool. That's not a circle, that's an oval. There we go. Mm, I'll do it a little bigger. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to have a start state. Um, and I'm going to have one more state, let's say. I think that's good enough. Okay. So the start state we denote by a tiny little arrow coming in from nothing. I'm going to call this uh, Q0. Um, I think I'll, I think I'll need one more state, actually. Let me see. Put one like that. Okay. Then... Uh, if we see a zero, uh, let's say we transition to this state. So we, we just denote the transition by zero. So uh, Q1, and let's say this is Q2. So what this is, is right. So if we're at Q0, we see a zero, we go to Q1. How would we write that in the transition function would be like, if we're at Q0, we see a zero, then that means we're at Q1, right? Now, suppose we're at Q0 and we see a 1. That means the first letter was a 1. We're going to go to Q2. Uh, then, if I'm at either of these states, I just want to keep staying in these states. So I'll say 0, 1. 0, 1. And I want my accepting state to be... that one so if we were to turn this dfa into the formal definition what we would have here is our transition function would be well defined for all eight entries which i'm kind of lazy i don't feel like doing it but you could imagine you could do it as another example uh all right so let's say d of Let's say you're at Q2 and you see a 0. So if you're at Q2 and you see a 0, you go to Q2. Right? You can do that for all 8. There's 8 because there's 2 times 3. Ooh, excuse me, there's 6. Yeah. Uh, what's going on here, sort of structurally, is we see is So let's, let's suppose we run this DFA on the string uh, 0, 1, 1. We're going to go from Q0 to Q1, then from Q1 to Q1, then from Q1 to Q1. Okay. If we go from Q... Now let's try the string 1, 1. If we're at Q0, 
we see a 1, we go to Q2. We see a 1 again, we go back to Q2. So you can think of the string as a sequence of choices, right? As, you know, which one do you take? Uh, what should be clear here is that only the first letter is what matters, because we go to, we sort of go to one of these two purgatories, and then we're stuck there forever. One purgatory uh, is accepting, and the other isn't. So that's why this is a DFA for this L, for this language. Yeah, so this DFA, this picture, is a lot easier than the uh, this formal definition. But the, you may need to come back to the formal definition and definition to do some sorts of problems, right? So now uh, let's do another problem. Let's do L2. L2, if you recall, was uh, x is a string and x has, I'll write it this way, the number of zeros, excuse me, the number of ones of x is even. So again, I'm gonna want our DFA. Let me just say how many states this is, let me think. Uh, so it takes a little bit of science to do these, right? I'm trying to come up with these on the fly. Uh, let's see, we need a start state. We need a state to keep track of it. I think that's it, actually. Spread it out a little bit, though. Yeah, I think that's it. Okay, so this is going to be our start state going to denote as q0. This is going to be our final state. It's going to be denoted as q1. Actually, this is not the final state. And I want, well, if we see a 1, we have an odd number of 1 so far. So we need to not accept until we see another uh, another 1. So what we're going to do is we're going to put, a, put an arrow like this, put a 1 here. And if we see a 1, Sorry, the angle's a little weird. We go back, and then this is the accept state. Okay, and if we're at either of these states, we just kind of want to ignore the zeros at all. We, this, we don't care about zeros in this language, so let's just always, if we see zero, let's just skip it, right? That's the way we do that. So, uh, If you if you notice what we're really sort of doing in the states is is we're kind of keeping track of a counter of the number of ones that we've seen mod two, right? Another thing is that the DFA ha does not know the length of its own input. It doesn't have any forward knowledge of anything. It doesn't know anything except one state that it's currently in, and that's it. So it has to be prepared. It's like death. At any moment, it could stop, and it would have no way of knowing if that was its last meal, right? It's got to just end. So we need to keep track at all times. Uh, there's no, like, post-processing we get to do. So if we see a 1 and we start, that means we've seen an odd number of 1 so far. We've seen 1-1. One, one. So we have to be in this state. If we see an even another 1, that means, okay, phew, we cancel out the previous 1. We go back 1. Great. Uh, I can actually, this state, this one is simple enough. I can write out the formal definition real quick. So sigma here, 0, 1. Q here is two states, Q0, Q1. Uh, Q0 is just that one. Uh, delta is well let's write it out let's write out all the elements so delta uh, also instead of q0 i'll just write zero well i'll just make it i'll just do it properly if we see a zero and we're at zero we go to uh, the same state if we see a zero and we're at q1 
we go to the same state. If we see a 1 and we're at Q0, we just flip the bit. So we get a Q1. If we see a 1 and we're at Q1, we go back to Q0, right? Then uh, F, our final state, is just what? The accepting state, right? It's the set containing the accepting state. So back to the memory thing. This is a this is a finite memory sort of model. It's keeping track of only the number of ones we've seen so far mod two. It can't keep track of much of anything else. So but given that we can sort of generalize to other modular equivalence classes. So let's do this language now. L3 uh, is equal to x is a string such that uh, the number of ones in x uh, is congruent to 1 or 2 uh, mod 3. So really, the number of ones is like 3k plus 1, 3k plus 2, uh, or any k, right? So we sort of do something, something similar again. So I think we're going to need three states this time, because last time we had two. Uh, this time we might need three. Let me give it some more room. Yeah. That should be OK. So um, again, we're at the start state. This is Q0. This is Q1. This is Q2. OK, so we want to keep track of the number of ones we've seen. OK, so if we see a single one, we go to Q1. We've seen two ones in a row. We go to Q2. If we see three ones in a row, we're back to zero, right? We reset the counter. That much is clear. Oh, and then we're basically done. And then each one, we sort of ignore the zeros. OK, then uh, we need to accept if it's we've seen one or two mod three ones. We do not want to accept uh, this one. So this is going to be a final state, and this is going to be a final state. I denote the final state by double circle. And th that's also in the book, by the way. That's how it's done. Uh, OK. So that's our that DFA will accept this language, L3. It's kind of funny, isn't it? Uh, so you can sort of generalize this. You can imagine this generalizes to accepting any nk plus l or whatever mod. So, you know, and for any n and l. Uh, you just sort of keep this sort of this this clock. This is li it's literally a clock, right? Um, now let's give a sort of different kind of DFA. So I have this pet rabbit, and it's kind of fat, and it's doesn't like doing exercise, which is not that good because it keeps getting fatter. It just sort of like vacuums up carrots and I, I, I run out of money. So I like to think that this rabbit is simple enough that it can be represented by DFA. It's behavior, right? So it has, it's really fat, by the way. It's, and it's a big breed to begin with, but it's like, it's really out there. I mean, uh, it has really two states. I see it do. Probably poops, but let's ignore it. That that exists because that's gross. Uh, like this, and then so let's say let's just it, the start state here is arbitrary. Doesn't really matter. Let's say the rabbit is currently eating. Okay. So if it uh, does not see carrots, that means it's finished all the carrots. So it's not going to keep eating. It's going to start sleeping. Okay. 
But once in a while, if you just drop carrots in front of it, it'll wake up and just start eating them. It starts vacuuming them up. Right. It really loves the baby carrots. So if you see carrots, though, it starts eating. If you're at, if it's eating carrots and it still sees carrots, it's just going to continue eating. It's not going to stop. It doesn't, it doesn't know how to save any. Okay. But if it's sleeping, nothing else happens. It's just going to keep sleeping, right? We can sort of model animalistic behavior as this state, state machine. There's no accept state. I mean, there's no right or wrong here. This is just sort of like the power of computation uh, for this model. I can express the behavior of the rabbit as a DFA, sort of. Um, this isn't a perfect definition for a few reasons. Uh, and you might think, well, okay, is it... A... You start asking, well, what about the power of certain animals with respect to the power of this computer? Um, so... Animals respond to sort of simple inputs and outputs in this way, right? If you shine a flashlight or add an animal, it's going to change behavior. So you give it some input, it's going to move to a different state, maybe a fear or excitement or something. So you think, okay, well, I can model the animal's behavior as some set of states and then these transition functions between them. That, in theory, might work, but in practice, you know, animals can learn. So what's actually going on is if there is a state machine to represent an animal like this, then it changes. It can update and teach itself. You know, you can condition like Pavlov taught his dogs to, to salivate. They, when he when he saw that was a that was not previously before he taught them. But that if you tr treat the behavior of a state machine, then it's an updating and constantly changing one. Uh, that's not in the model though. A state machine is fixed. So then animals. Maybe some bugs aren't. Maybe there are bugs who are incapable of learning, but animals are sort of above the power of a state machine. So a state machine, in that regard, sort of in this, this sort of pseudo-philosophical argument, is not a really a good computer, right? We're going to prove it's not a good computer also by showing languages where other computers can recognize that this one can't. Okay. Let's talk about a second kind of computer. I'm going to call it uh, an NFA, which stands for the mouthful non deterministic uh, finite automata. I'm never going to call it this, just going to call it NFA from here on out. Basically, we have, in contrast to the deterministic finite automata, this one is non deterministic. So, what does that mean? The definition is basically the same, but with a little more complexity to give us uh, better looking DFAs, essentially. The stake diagrams are much nicer. So, we have three sort of colloquial points. One, we can have transitions that are kind of, uh, let me draw a small circle this time. Something like this. So given at some state, who knows where we are, if we see a one, we have choices. We can choose to go either up or down here. We can choose to go to which state we want to. We're not restricted uh, in this sense. We we have options. Before, if you recall the DFA, you could not you could take you could not have transitions like this. This was impossible. You know, it doesn't make sense. I'll get into more detail about this. This is the non-deterministic property. I'll get into a lot of detail about this first one. But for now, I'm just mentioning it. Two, we have epsilon uh, transitions. What that means is uh, we have some states like this, and we have a uh,
uh, some epsilon transition, then we basically take it for free. You can think of it like a chutes and ladders. Like you go down one of these slides, you go all the way to the end, right? You have to make the noise too with your mouth when you take it. That's part of the rules. Uh, basically, you don't take a letter. If you choose, choice is important here, if you choose to take epsilon. So for example, take this sort of sub view of a DFA. I've sort of cut everything out and I'm only focusing on this. Let's say this is QI and this is QJ. If, uh, and maybe they have some other transition, who knows. If you're at QI and you see a zero, you technically can end up at QJ. You say, I take the epsilon first, then I take the zero. So this, that's valid. You go sh zero, bam. The final thing is just sort of a syntactic uh, niceness is that delta does not have to be well-defined. So what that means is if you have some, uh, let's say QI and then some symbol A, then this is uh, not defined. Uh, then we just reject, immediately reject. You can think of that like uh, there's some imaginary state here where all these undefined things are coming into, and then we just zero comma one. It just makes things easier if we want to say, okay, I don't care if we take this. I'm going to not even write it because I'm going to ignore it. There's a purgatory for us. Now, the formal definition of an NFA is exactly the same as a DFA, where we have sigma, q, q0, delta, and f. But before we had uh, delta went from, it took a single state and a... Uh, a single letter to a single state. Here, the NFA takes, uh, well, I should write it like, the, 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 the NFA takes a single state and then it takes either a symbol or the empty string, epsilon, and it, outputs a set of states right sometimes this is written as like a script p of the set this is the power set so it's a set of all sets uh of a set right so here this is just the set of all sets. so it maps to a set a, a, a subset instead of a single element it maps to any a set of them as an example if i were to write like uh Let's say I had something like this. And this is QI, this is QJ, this is QK. It's more like A's, but then I would say that uh, uh, delta of QI comma one equal to the set Q, uh, QJ, those are not looking like Qs, uh, QK. Okay, so I think that I'm going to go into very, uh, a lot of detail now about non-determinism. Uh, I think that non-determinism is a little cursed in its explanation non deter and i guess it's spelling too min ism so it seems like every year students have trouble understanding non-determinism when the actual idea is a lot simpler than the explanations so i'm going to try and give several explanations right so the first explanation nfa run on word x accepts if at least 
one ch choice of paths of x accepts. So you basically, you know, we have splits in things. You take both, and if one of them reaches the uh, accept state, then fine. You can also think of it as like a depth first search. You depth first search this x on this on on the decision tree of the of the NFA, and then if you reach a state uh, that accepts, then great. You stop. You don't have to even care about the rest of it. Two. Here's an interesting explanation: time travel. So suppose you're at a state, and uh, let's draw it like this. You have some sort of weird sci-fi uh, timelines, right? So, at each state, you, like, make a clone of yourself, and then you send yourself down the two possible choices. Right? So, one, two. And then, every time you come to a decision like this, you clone yourself again. And then, if one of the clones reaches a accepting state, like, in that alternate universe, they push a button on their fancy Rick and Morty remote. And then all the clones accept. But if they don't reach uh, an accept state after the length of the input, then they reject. Right? Three. Uh, a lucky coin. S uh, sometimes people call this smart guesses. I like this explanation the least, but I think it's the most clear. So... Imagine again the time travel thing, but instead you're a deterministic actor, right? So you come to a, f a fork in the road, like literally like, like a trail, and there's forks on it, like you're hiking, okay? And then you see a road, a split in the, a fork in the road, and you have a lucky coin, which you just flip, and it tells you which one to take, or it could be a dice or whatever, right? It tells you which path to take, and it's always right every single time. So the coin gives you this advice, and it uh, helps you lead to the accept state, if there is one, you know. There's a poem by Robert Frost uh, called The Road Not Taken, and it's uh, it ends with something like, uh, Two roads diverge in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that made all the difference. And so I guess in that story, Robert Frost, if he's talking about himself, would be a deterministic actor and he had to make a choice of which road to take but if he was non-deterministic he comes to a fork in the road and he can just take it you know he doesn't have to choose he's in both um i'm going to now why do we care about uh nfas you know dfas seem plenty fine i'm going to show the power uh of nfas so consider this language uh, uh, let's say x is a string. Well, x is in sigma star, and x ends with, let's just choose some long substrings. Let's say 1, 1, 0, 1, 0. Okay. Now, to make a DFA for this language, it's possible, but it's really ugly and hard. It's going to need, you're going to have to keep the state of the last five bits. So you need like 32 states, maybe some more for if the strings are less than four. I don't know what happens uh, with those, and I don't really care. But the, the, the DFA way for this would be like, all states would be denoted by like Q... Uh, let's say x, y, I'm not even going to do the commas. Let's say x, y, z, u, v, 
something like that, right? And let's say you're at a state and you see a one, then you would go to a state denoted by uh, one x y z u. So you keep track of the last five digits at all times, and then and then uh, the final state would just be q one one zero one zero, right, and nothing else. Uh, that's the idea. It's a little more complicated than that. And who has time for 32 states? 32 states and then a binary alphabet, 64 transitions at least. You know, who knows? I don't care. Here's how the NFA looks. It's much more simpler. Uh, let me... Nope. It's too small. Draw a circle. Okay. So let's see, we need a start state, and then we need at least one uh, per uh, thing we have, right? So I think that's six then. Okay. And then, uh, well, what does our NFA look like? Well, remember, so let's just say we just loop forever until non-deterministically we guess we're five uh, symbols away from the end, right? Then the machine knows through its superior power of guessing to take this first transition. And then we have only the state except. And uh, this is the start state. That's the whole DFA. I mean, excuse me. That's the whole NFA. That's it. So it might look long. Actually, that's the most states we've drawn on, uh, on a state diagram. But I didn't draw 32 states. So this an NFA for this here, uh, the NFA solution takes n plus 1 states, while the DFA solution uh, takes at least who knows how much more than two to the n? It's it's a great space compression. And also notice I didn't put any of these extra arrows where like if there was a zero or a one, because I don't care. I know that we reject if we take it. So now let's execute a word like x one one zero one zero on this. Right? We're gonna loop through as many times as we can, and in fact we may end up here again through a reject state. That's fine because there exists a path where eventually this machine may decide to take this one whenever it feels like it. It may decide now is my chance. We may say, okay, we take all, if we look at all paths, this is what we do. We say one, one, zero, one, zero. And if it ends with that, we're done. So this is the power of an NFA. I mean, it's really good. So on a homework, if we say, you know, give it DFA, give it NFA, I would prefer to give the NFA because it's sort of, it's a, it's faster and looser and, you know, you know what you're talking about, really. Why do we care about NFAs? So, first off, let, uh, let L uh, DFA equal the set of, uh, the class of languages uh, decidable by a DFA. So for every DFA, a language is in LDFA, right? Clearly, LDFA is then a subset of LNFA. Uh, so it's like Superman, right? If you ignore the whole kryptonite thing, every NFA, every DFA, excuse me, is an NFA, right? But not every NFA is DFA, necessarily. 
So therefore, every language that a DFA can recognize can also be recognized by an NFA because that NFA is also then just a DFA without using the superpowers, right? So Superman is just a normal human. He doesn't do any flying, right? Uh, but take a second to guess if you can think there exists, if, if this is the, if the converse is true. So if L uh, NFA is a subset of L, uh, DFA, right? Or if there might exist uh, an element in LNFA which is which could not be decided by a DFA, right? The answer it's actually this is also true. So together these combined imply that uh, NFAs are exactly as powerful as uh, DFAs. When I say power, I'm not talking about efficiency. This class is not about efficiency, it's about possibility. So if something's possible, that's good enough. We don't care about optimizations of speed or anything like that until the end. But for now, it's just about possibility. So the, even though the NFA might use less states than the DFAs, they have the same power, right? They can do the same things. So let's prove it and this is going to be a, a sort of a two i'm going to have the, the formal proof here is kind of ugly and then there uh it's much clearer when we do some examples so the proof is that we just make a dfa for each nfa right so uh Given NFA with uh, sigma Q, uh, Q0, uh, delta, and F, we can construct a unique uh, DFA for this NFA. So let's start. Sigma prime is just the same as sigma. And the primes are for the DFA. So I'll say... You know, we make DFA D. So, sigma is the same, right? Because the NFA can be in uh, any in a set of possible states, we need a state per subset of possible states. So we say Q prime. It's going to be uh, the set of all subsets of Q. Sometimes you may see this written as uh, the power set of Q, right? It's, it is called power set, but you may see it written as script P. Uh, what this basically means is, for example, if uh, 2 to the, let's say, uh, 0, 1, it's going to be the set containing the empty set, the set 0, set containing 0, the set containing 1, and then the set containing uh, 0, 1. Right, so that should be a set. So it's a set of all subsets. So each state of our DFA is going to be correspond to a subset. Okay? Our start state of our DFA is going to correspond to the... Uh, set corresponding to the previous start state and uh, any epsilons from that start state. So I'm going to write this like for all i such that d uh, q from the start state to has an epsilon transition to some state qi. So the starts, the previous start state of the NFA and any epsilons from that. The transition function, which does sort of the heavy lifting here, is, so let's say uh, S is a state in Q prime, which means it's a subset, which means S is a subset of Q, right? Uh, then S, uh, the, the transition from state S on symbol A is going to just be the union of all possible transitions in the... Uh, 
in the NFA. So it's going to look something like this. Chinese S. And then I'm going to say counting epsilon transitions. So if we see an epsilon transition, we have to we'll take it as well. That counts in in our in our union. Okay. And then finally, our final states are just going to be. Uh, all the states that contain a final state in the NFA. So if, you know, some F is in the NFA's final state and uh, F is in some subset, uh, then uh, S is a final state in our DFA, right? So for example, if one was a final state, then, uh, then like one, two would be a final state, uh, zero, one would be a final state, etc. as well as one, right? This is sort of not as pretty as the example should be. So let's just do an example. So I'm going to make a really uh, simple DFA. Let's make the DFA that does this. Okay, yeah. Actually, hold on. Give me some more room there. So I'm going to make this DFA. Uh, Let's call, just for simplicity, let's call this state zero. Let's call this state one. I'm just going to drop the Q notation for a second. This is, excuse me, an NFA. And we're going to have a simple sort of lock like this. This is going to be one and this is going to be zero. So then let's make this the accepting state. What this means is, you know, we see a zero. We see a one, we see a zero, we see a one, we see a zero, we see a one, and we reject everything else. So what that looks like is like the language is gonna look like zero, one uh, to the N for this one. So let's make the DFA for it. So we need one state per possible set of subsets. So there's two elements, we have four subsets, right? So let's start off with four states. Oops. I'm going to draw them just like this, uh, just for simplicity. So let's say, let's call this one empty. Let's call this one zero. Let's call this one one. And let's call this one zero one. Okay. Uh, let's go in order. So those are the states done. The start state is then, uh, the previous start state and anything that could epsilon transition to it. We don't have any epsilon transitions. So it's just the same state here. The transition function is for each state, we're gonna map the states. So let's start with state zero. State zero, we see a zero. We could only be, we could either reject or we can go to state uh, one. If we see a one, we immediately reject. What that means is we go to this, uh, our purgatory state. We, the uh, empty set state is usually our purgatory. All right, now if we see, if we're at state one and we see a zero, we go to purgatory. If we're at state one and we see one, we go back to state zero. If we're at state zero and one simultaneously and we see a zero, we could have only been in state one. 
if we're in state zero and one simultaneously, and we see a zero, and we see a, uh, we see a one, we could only have been in state zero. We could have only been going to state zero. So here's our DFA. We need the final states. Hold on. So zero is a final state. So anything containing zero is a final state. So zero and zero one are final states here. Okay. Uh, first thing you may notice immediately, this is not minimal, right? This, this zero one state, sure, it's an accepting state. But there's no thing going into it. You'll never reach it. So what we can do at this step or any other step is just simplify. We can say, ah, oh, I'm going to ignore this. So I, maybe I shouldn't erase it. But I'm going to just draw uh, a line around it saying this is unnecessary. Right. So then we have a DFA there of three states. And it does the exact same thing, if you notice. If we have one and zero, we're in lockstep. But as soon as we uh, diverge, we go to this purgatory. And sometimes, if you're trying to convert an NFA to a DFA, it's not always as easy as just doing this algorithm. Instead, it might be easier just to m manually do it. right? So here I would say, oh, there's a purgatory here because we need to just do that. And then it's done because this one is that simple. right? So this was kind of almost too simple of an example. Let's do one more. And I'm going to do another small one. So let's do, um, uh, let's see, let's do, I only want to do two state ones because a three state one would take uh, eight states. And I kind of don't want to do that. So let's do that. Let's say this is our start state and zero. Epsilon one, and then let's call the state zero, and let's let's make this the accept state, called state one. So just by noticing this NFA, you should be able to see. Okay, I'm going to have any number of zeros. Then I'm going to start having any number of ones, but no more zeros after that. So that's going to be uh, zero to the i, uh, one to the j for i comma j are greater than or equal to zero. So they can both be zero, by the way, right? You take an epsilon transition and here's the empty string. So let's make the uh, DFA for this NFA, right? Again, we're going to need four states. So I'm going to do, I'm going to put them like this though, because I have uh, some preemptive knowledge of what this structure might look like. Okay, so let's call this, uh, let's call it this way. I'm going to put 0, 1 here. I'm going to put 0 here, 1 here, and I'm going to put the empty set here. Okay, back to the algorithm. We've done the states. Now we need to make the start state. The start state was 0, but we have an epsilon transition to 1. Therefore, the start state is 0, 1. We can only have one start state. So it's, cert it's not just 0. So saying the start state with zero here would be incorrect. It's zero one, right? Uh, now let's go for the transition function. If we're at state zero and we see a zero, where could we be? We could either be at zero and nowhere else. If we see a one, we could take this epsilon and be at state one. Okay, if we're at state one and we see a zero, we immediately reject. So we denote that as going to our purgatory. And I'll go ahead and add this here, 0, 1. And if we're at uh, state 1 and we see a 1, we go back to ourselves. OK. Now, if we're in both 0 and 1 simultaneously, um, and we see a zero, we could only go to zero. 
There are some reject paths, obviously, but zero is a valid one. So we care if there's at least one valid path. If we're at zero, both zero and one, and we see a one, then we could only go to state one. If we're at, now, I think that's it for the transition function. Now let's do the final states. So one was a final state. So anything containing one is now a final state uh, here. So this is a final state. And this is a final state. Okay. Again, this is not minimal, but it's a different kind of uh, optimization. You may say, oh, I want a smaller TFA. Well, if you notice here, we're going to do a bunch of zeros here anyway, and we start with one zero at least, right? So we could just make this the accepting and starting state as well and cut this out, right? So let me, let me go ahead and draw that again. But we don't need to do that. It's fine. We're here to show existence of a DFA, and we don't really care too much about what the DFA looks like. So this algorithm is uh, obviously correct, right? Uh, the book has a great example of a three-state DFA with lots of transitions and some epsilons and some weird stuff. But then the DFA has eight states, and then he reduces it to six. And it's like, well, you know, that's kind of a lot of work. He doesn't even fully describe, you know, what each step of that process is. But this is the idea behind it. We basically simulate the NFA as DFA. And because we can do this, then NFAs are equal in power to DFAs. So what that really means is here that non-determinism gives us no power. Kind of a very, uh, it's a sort of beautiful fact. You would think we have a Superman-like ability here, to do all this time travel and stuff, and it turns out it doesn't matter. It just saves us some cost, but we can't do anything that a human couldn't do. You know, like maybe Superman can move a mountain, but... So could humans if you gave them enough time, right? So the power is the same. 